Hello, welcome to Tala Talks NICU. Today we are going through part three of the blood gases. So if you haven't watched part one and part two, go back and watch them now. There is going to be quite a bit of repetition in this video, but as we all know, that's how we learn by just being exposed to stuff over and over again until it finally sinks in. So today we are going to go through three main concepts. And again, there's quite a bit of repetition here, so bear with me. The first thing is we're gonna go through the two ways in which a gas can be acidotic. The second thing we're gonna go through is the two ways in which a gas can be alkalotic. And the third thing that we're going to go through today is the whole concept of compensation by the body to try to get that pH back to neutral. I think this really confuses a lot of people, but it's a very straightforward concept. So bear with us and I promise you by the end of this video, you will understand it. Right, let's start with the two different ways in which you can have an acidosis or a pH of less than 7.35. So the first one, as you all know, is a respiratory acidosis and the second one is a metabolic acidosis. So let's start by talking about respiratory acidosis. Okay, so respiratory acidosis happens when there is insufficient ventilation. Ventilation, remember, is the process of getting rid of carbon dioxide. And ventilation, if you go back and watch the ventilator videos, as you will remember, is dependent on the rate of the breath as well as the tidal volume. Or another way of saying that is ventilation is dependent on how fast you breathe as well as how deep each breath is. So if an infant is barely taking any breaths or what we call periodic breathing in the NICU, so we'll take a breath and then might just hang out for a couple of seconds before the baby takes another breath, or the baby is breathing very shallowly, then this would be considered inadequate ventilation. The carbon dioxide would then build up in the blood. That carbon dioxide will combine with water in the blood and create carbonic acid. So a high CO2 results in a respiratory acidosis or a PCO2 above 45 is considered a respiratory acidosis. The second cause of an acidosis in blood is a metabolic acidosis or an acidosis resulting from a buildup of acid that is not directly related to breathing issues. This can happen in two main ways. The first one is a buildup of excess acid. And the second one is, is if the body loses too much bicarbonate. And if you remember, bicarbonate is the main base or alkali, they mean the same thing in the body. So it's logical that if you lose too much alkali, then what's left will be too acidic. The most common type of excess acid that we see that causes metabolic acidosis is a buildup of lactic acid. And as you remember, lactic acid builds up when the cells aren't getting enough oxygen. So there are a myriad of reasons why a cell can't be getting enough oxygen. For example, sepsis, dehydration, anemia, congenital heart diseases, inborn errors of metabolism like an organic acidemia, HIE, the list goes on and on. All of those can cause a metabolic acidosis from a buildup of lactic acid. Or another cause of the metabolic acidosis is if the body wastes too much bicarbonate. We already talked about the fact that premature infant's kidneys are also very immature. So the proximal convoluted tubule that's responsible for kind of reabsorbing the bicarbonate normally is very underdeveloped in preemie babies, and it can just dump out that bicarbonate at a much higher rate than it should. So that in itself can cause a metabolic acidosis. There are other ways that we can waste bicarbonate. For example, if a baby has really bad diarrhea, that can also result in too little bicarbonate in the body. There are ways to differentiate these two different types of metabolic acidosis, whether you've kind of got a buildup of an acid, especially a lactic acid, or whether you just don't have enough bicarbonate. Obviously, you'd be a lot more concerned about the cause if there really were a buildup of lactic acid. That's where the whole anion gap comes in and the whole elevated ionin gap acidosis and normal anion gap acidosis. I will do a lecture about this another time, but for now I just want you to understand the whole concept of metabolic acidosis. 
To reiterate again, in metabolic acidosis, you'll have a low bicarbonate, less than 18, and you will have a base deficit of minus three or more. So for example, if you have a gas like 7.12, 62, 15, minus eight, then obviously this is an acidotic gas because the pH is less than 7.4. It's much less than 7.4, it's 7.12. So we know flat out that we have acidosis. Now the CO2 is 62, which is higher than 45. So in this case, you also have a respiratory acidosis. What about the bicarb? The bicarb is 15, which is less than 18, and the base is minus eight, which is less than minus three. So these are both consistent with a metabolic acidosis. So in this gas, you have a respiratory acidosis as well as a metabolic acidosis. This is what we call a mixed acidosis. Right, now let's talk about number two, the two different ways that a blood gas can be alkalotic or a pH is more than 7.45. So the first way is a respiratory alkalosis. Remember, ventilation, again, is dependent on how fast you breathe and how deeply you breathe. So if a patient is breathing very rapidly or very deeply, then the carbon dioxide in the blood will go down. Because the carbon dioxide will go down in the blood, it will shift the equation the other way. And instead of ending up with a buildup of acid, you'll end up with less acid or more alkali in the blood. So a CO2 of less than 35 in the blood is considered respiratory alkalosis. There are several common scenarios that can end up with a respiratory alkalosis. For example, if you've turned up the rate way too high on a breathing machine, on the ventilator, then that could allow the baby to blow off a lot of CO2 and you could cause an iatrogenic, which means that it's our fault, it's the medical team's fault that it's happening, type of respiratory alkalosis. This is actually also what happens when older patients have panic attacks. So they breathe really, really deeply and really rapidly. And if you remember the kind of an older method of dealing with panic attacks was to put a paper bag that the person having the panic attack could breathe into. And the whole point of that was that then that patient would be re-inhaling some of that carbon dioxide so it wouldn't be as severe, the respiratory alkalosis. If a baby is lacking oxygen or they're hypoxemic, sometimes they will also breathe really deeply to try to get as much oxygen into the body as possible. And as a result of that, they might be over breathing the CO2 out. So that in itself could end up with a respiratory alkalosis. Another interesting cause of respiratory alkalosis is a high ammonia level. And you can end up with a high ammonia level from a liver disease, from a metabolic disease, like especially the urea cycle defects, or from a disease that premature infants get that's called transient hyperammonemia, I can never say that word, a prematurity. And these can all end up with like an ammonia level in the several hundreds. For whatever reason, this causes a respiratory alkalosis. And sometimes this is how these diseases are actually diagnosed because you end up with a low CO2 really of uncertain etiology and you start delving into a cause and you'll end up with one of these. The second cause for an alkalosis, logically, is a metabolic alkalosis. And this happens when you have a bicarbonate level of more than 30 in blood. The most common reason for this is when the kidneys, for whatever reason, are abnormally retaining the bicarbonate. So instead of allowing it, the body to just pee out the bicarbonate and lose it that way, the kidneys are holding onto it and allowing the bicarbonate level to get up. In the NICU, there are really three main reasons or three main scenarios where we see a metabolic alkalosis. The first one is a compensatory alkalosis, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, where really that isn't the initial problem. The second one is when we give diuretics, especially when we give loop diuretics. So for example, Lasix or Bumex, furosemide. So, in those cases, it throws off the balance of the channels in the kidneys, and as a result, it, the kidneys end up absorbing a lot more of the bicarbonate than they should. 
So remember, if you are giving Lasix for several doses and then you get a gas following that, do not be surprised when you see a bicarbonate level of 33, because that's a direct result of the Lasix that you've given. The third reason that we see very commonly in the unit is when we've just put too much acetate in the TPN. So initially the baby was wasting a lot of bicarb, so we were trying to kind of give more base. And then even though the kidneys have gotten better, we're still giving too much base and then that builds up. The acetate gets converted to the bicarbonate and so you end up with a metabolic alkalosis. There are lots of other reasons and especially on exams why a baby might have metabolic alkalosis so for example a pyloric stenosis where a baby's puking out a lot of the acid that's found in the stomach or a cystic fibrosis both of these can classically cause metabolic alkalosis but obviously they're a lot less rare in the unit right now let's move on to part three or the concept of the compensation of blood gases the first thing you need to remember is that the body is a very tightly regulated ship. So if there is anything slightly off with the body, then it will do whatever it takes to try to get it back to neutrality or the status quo. So for example, if you have a hormone level that's too high or a mineral level that's too low, the body will try to correct that. And that's exactly the same with the acidity in blood. The body will do whatever it can to try to get back to a pH of 7.4. So the respiratory system and the kidneys will work individually and often against each other to correct the mistake that the other one is making. It's kind of difficult to understand unless we go through examples. So let's go ahead and just go through an example. So let's say you have a baby with a congenital heart disease and because of the heart disease, the body is not getting the oxygen that it needs. So there is a buildup of lactic acid or there is a metabolic acidosis now in the blood. The body does not like having a metabolic acidosis, so it's going to do what it can to try to get the pH back to neutral. So in this case, what the body will try to do is create a respiratory alkalosis to try to neutralize that metabolic acidosis. So the body will start breathing rapidly and maybe also deeply. And we see this very often in congenital heart disease babies that have a slight metabolic acidosis and they're lying there very comfortably because their lungs are working fine, just breathing very rapidly, trying to blow off that CO2 and get that pH of that blood closer to 7.4. So you may end up with a gas like this, 7.21, 28, because the CO2 is low because of the respiratory alkalosis, 13, the bicarb is low because you have a metabolic acidosis, and minus 11, which obviously also goes along with the metabolic acidosis. So yes, you still have an acidosis, but it's not nearly as low the pH as it would be if the CO2 were normal. Let's give another example. This time, let's talk about the kidneys trying to compensate from issues going on with the lungs. Now the kidneys, as you can logically imagine, take a lot longer to compensate for issues with the lungs. So maybe a few days, at least a few hours before you can see some sort of changes from what's going on with the lungs. The most common scenario that we see in the unit is in babies with chronic lung disease who have and we allow a slightly higher carbon dioxide level. So they have PCO2s in the low 60s, let's say. So that would be a respiratory acidosis and it would be continuing for some time. Obviously, if you've got chronic lung disease and this has been going on for a long time, the kidneys will try to counteract that by creating a metabolic alkalosis to try to get the pH closer to 7.4. So in that situation, the kidney will be retaining the bicarbonate. The bicarbonate will go up and therefore you end up with a metabolic alkalosis. So you could end up with a gas like this, 7.28, so it's still an acidosis, 67, and that's the respiratory acidosis part from the chronic lung disease, 30, so you can see that you have a high bicarb, it's exactly at the point of metabolic alkalosis and a base excess of plus seven. 
that would be consistent with a primary respiratory acidosis and then a compensatory metabolic alkalosis. Another important concept you need to understand is that the body will not overcompensate for the initial issue. So if you have a respiratory acidosis, the kidney is not going to end up retaining so much bicarb that overall the blood ends up being alkalotic. Same thing with if you have a metabolic acidosis, the lungs aren't going to be able to breathe off so much carbon dioxide that you end up with an alkalotic blood. Because of that, you can look at the gas and then always figure out what the primary issue is or what the primary problem is and then what is actually causing the compensation. So let's go through examples. So for the first example, the infant with a congenital heart disease, where the gas was 721, 28, 13, minus 11, the pH is less than 7.4. So this is an acidosis. So therefore, the metabolic acidosis is the primary issue with a compensatory respiratory alkalosis. We cannot say that the problem with this baby is that it's just breathing too fast. And really we have issues with overventilating this kid because we still have an acidosis. The primary issue isn't going to be the respiratory alkalosis because the blood is not alkalotic. Okay, what about the second example with the pH of 728, CO2 of 67, bicarb of 30, and a base excess of plus 7? Again, the pH is 728. This is acidotic. So, again, this must be a respiratory acidosis as the primary issue because we're not going to get overcompensation. So, we also, in this case, do have a compensatory metabolic alkalosis, but that is not going to be the primary issue because if that were the primary issue, the pH would be 7.54 or something. That is a lot of information. I hope that it all kind of starts to fit together. The best way to really understand it is just to go through lots of examples. So we're going to be releasing um, a lot of videos on different blood gases and how to interpret them and then what we should do about them. In the meantime, I really hope you learned something. Please remember to like and subscribe and to answer the multiple choice questions under the community tab. And thank you very much for being here.